the meeting today with the Pledge of Allegiance. And we're very fortunate here tonight to have uh, Dianara Duenas and Daniel Perez Olivo, sixth graders from Roosevelt School, who are going to be leading us in the pledge tonight. Welcome. Good evening, board members board. and superintendent and Andrade. Thank you for having the thank you for having Roosevelt Bears here with you tonight virtually. Before we start our pledge, we want to shout out all of our students and staff at Roosevelt for being leaders, independent, and hardworking. Please stand up. Put your right hand over your heart. Face the flag. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and justice for all. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. What a special treat tonight to have these two wonderful students from Roosevelt with us. Thank you so much to the students, to the principal, and to their teachers. We are um, thankful that you are here with us. So we're going to start off tonight. Um, and I am looking for a motion to adopt the agenda. I move. All right. Do I have a second? A second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right. We have adopted the agenda. I'd like to report that there was no action taken during closed session. We're going to move on to acknowledgments, and uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Andrade. Thank you. So uh, in this particular uh, meeting, we want to recognize the Filipino American History Month that is celebrated in October. Uh, Filipino Americans are the second largest Asian American group in the nation and the third largest ethnic group in California. The celebration of Filipino American History Month commemorates the first recorded presence of Filipinos in the continental United States, which occurred in October 18, 1587 when Luzones Indios came ashore from the Spanish galleon Nuestra Señora de Esperanza and landed at what is now called Morro Bay, California. And in particular for Salinas, we have a very uh, special uh, presence since 1933 when the Filipino Labor Union was formed and it was here in Salinas, California that that started. So we are very grateful to all of our families and to everyone in our community that is celebrating Filipino American History Month. Thank you. And may I add something? Yes, please. We have the Honorable Art Alimba. Yes, we do. Uh, Representing also the uh, Filipino community. Yes, thank you. Thank you. In our presence. Yeah. A very proud yes. member of the Filipino community. Yes, I am. Born and raised. Well, it's it's always um, it's always a good thing to be able to recognize. Uh, different parts of our community. And so um, thank you for You're this welcome. acknowledgement. All means all. <laughs> all means all, yes. And now we're ready to hear from our employee organizations. And we're gonna start with the Salinas Elementary Teachers Council. And I believe that would be Pamela. Good evening, it is me. And um, just, I had some comments that I mentioned my beautiful stepmother who passed away. Um, you know, I've written some, but because it came up, she was a beautiful Filipina and um, much loved since I was six years old. Um, and I love that we're honoring her. Um, so good evening, trustees, superintendents, Lena's community. I'm Pamela Connor, SCTC president and a fourth grade teacher at Bronda Meadows. Uh, my 80 year old father moved in with my family a few months ago. He lost his 68 year old wife of 45 years in January. My stepmom had always been our bridge. So the transition to being his caretaker has been a little bit interesting. But in these few months, I've really learned that love is an action, not a feeling. And appreciation is like love. 
it really is an action. Appreciate, appreciation isn't well expressed in tchotchkes or inexpensive mass distributed tokens, though we've all used those to try to tell people that they matter to us. Um, all educators, certificated and class staff and classified staff members have a very overwhelming workload, all of us. <laughs> For many, it doesn't end at the end of any work day or work year. My dad, a lifelong sandblaster, says, now that he's with us, dang, seems you should be able to come home after a long day of work and just relax, not have another meeting or more work to grade. Um, sometimes I agree, but we make those choices to have a career that provides us a lot of satisfaction and the impact that we're able to have. Uh, appreciation could and should be shown by those with power by carefully considering the additional work that is asked of us before another task is added, ask, is this the best use of this educator's time? Is this necessary? During this COVID crisis, is this mandate, requirement, request, what is best for students? Our members would hope that our administrators keep that in mind before attempting to implement something that to them may seem minor. Our SETC site leaders and our leadership team is here to help to try to make those things smoother. That's what we do, we help, we collaborate. Kind of brings me back to the idea of my stepmom as a bridge. You trustees have recently seemed to separate issues into parent student concerns and staff concerns, but staff members are your bridge. Teachers, specialists, custodians, bus drivers, secretaries, food service workers, all of us are your bridge to the parents and students. No one, including yourselves as trustees, cares more about making positive connections with students and parents. No one has more contact with them. Every day, staff go above and beyond with their time, their money, their support, their love to meet the needs of our families. Our students are our second families. We love them long after they leave our schools. From the California School Boards Association, directly as a quote, school board members are locally elected public officials entrusted with governing a community's public schools. The role of the school board is to ensure that school districts are responsive to the values, beliefs, and priorities of their communities. And this Salinas community includes all of us, educators, support staff, parents, students, and caring community members. Though you have removed language about shared leadership and collaboration from your governance handbook, you still hold the responsibility to promote those goals for the success of this community's public schools. Thank you as always, working together. Thank you, Pamela, for those words. Um, moving along, we're going to hear from the California School Employees Association, and I'm believing that is Rosie tonight. Okay, Rosie, um, if we've missed you, uh, just pipe in a little later. Otherwise, we're going to move on to the United Substitute Teachers Union. That would be Katie. No, uh, no Katie. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, were there any replies to previous concerns or questions? There were none. All right. Uh, we come to the part of the meeting now, public comment. <clears throat> and uh, tonight we are trying uh, another way of uh, delivering public comment so that we may uh, actually feel like we're we're with you and uh, I believe we're going on to zoom and I'm hoping that the IT people will let me know should I introduce yeah if I'm going to mention the name, the name. okay Correct. so first up we have Jeremy Galimba and Jeremy I know I've said your name but if you will please when you introduce yourself uh, let us know your name and your association that would be great sure 
All right, good evening, Superintendent Andrade, President Ish, and Board of Trustees. My name is Jeremy Glimba, and um, I am an SCTC member and academic coach. Um, one of the reasons I have remained a teacher here at Selena City was to have the opportunity to work together with fellow educators to give our community a better future and, uh, frankly, a new reputation. Uh, being born and raised here in Salinas, uh, I hated the reputation that we had for having a vindictive gang culture. Um, and I believe that education is one of the primary ways that we can shape future generations to address life's problems and disagreements in a civil and constructive manner. Uh, unfortunately, the recent culture I have witnessed in our district models something different. Uh, because of disparaging remarks that have been made at board meetings, on social media, and in personal conversations, there seems to be a general hesitance to speak the truth or even one's own opinion for fear of public disrespect or retaliation. As a result, I feel that trust in the leadership of our district is beginning to erode. Uh, this culminated at the public comment given by JC Smith during the last board meeting. Um, and as a disclaimer, I have no idea who JC Smith is or uh, whether that's simply an alias name. Uh, however, in the interest of rebuilding trust, I would like to hear a response from the board that, uh, about the claims that were presented. Uh, one particular claim was concerning the social media post from Trustee Ramirez, which read as follows. I will not apologize for rising up the voices of parents and my constituents. I will not. A nobody academic coach thinks I need to apologize for raising concerns parents brought to me at a board meeting. None of the comments I made were my own and no teachers were put down. That idiota obviously did not watch the board meeting or she would not have made the accusations she made. I'm not scared like the others. I know how to do my job. All the parents who complained came from her school, so she is part of the problem. And I shared her email with those parents. Never ever cut down parents. Although a public apology may not have previously been warranted, I believe it certainly is warranted now. Please help us reinstate a culture of trust into this district where we can disagree without being disrespectful. As long as we attack the people we are leading instead of attacking the problems we are facing, we will never be able to move forward to a better future. As leaders, we all make mistakes. However, it's our response to those mistakes that define both our integrity and our influence. Let us all remember that leadership is not always about doing things right. Instead, it's always about doing the right thing. Let's all lead by doing the right thing, even when it's hard. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have Anna Burleson. And Anna, again, um, if I'm introducing you, but if you could please introduce yourself and then your association, we'd be grateful. Yes, good. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Andrade, respected district staff, teachers, and classified employees. I'm Anna Burleson, the academic coach at Los Padres Elementary. And I want to start by thanking the person. Um, I believe like Jeremy said, her name was JC Smith. And I don't know who she is either, who at the October 12th meeting shared with the public what the board member had said um, in a social media post. And um, she was referring to me as the nobody and an idiot because I'm the only, I was the coach who spoke up to talk about our teachers too. Um, teachers were very upset, of course, at the comments made in September. Um, I admit my first instinct was uh, to defend myself and express outrage. However, on second thought, I'd rather say this. Um, as teachers, we recognize that parents are going through a very challenging time and situation. We know that because many of us, our parents as well, many of our teachers struggle. And as a coach, I hear these struggles and I, I see the stress and the burdens on teachers because as Pamela said, our kids, they're like our second family. We care about them. We, we, we spend our time, our money, we, we take, it's very personal because we spend time away from our families to invest in, in, in our children. And so, it's, it's, it's very personal, um, but we're not here to minimize anyone's frustration or stress. This is an unusual time that we've never had to go through and we're facing this worldwide. 
So as teachers and staff, we want to support and we continue to support parents, our students, and each other as colleagues. And we, we're working to not create adversarial situations. We're, as Pamela says, we're trying to bridge things. We're trying to listen. We listen to parents. We listen to the students. We're here, Dr. Morales, Ms. Macias, the staff at the district, they're, they're working so hard to, to get everything that the students need to them. And parents, we hear you. You're working hard. You're struggling economically, mentally. It's, this is very, very hard, hard for everybody. So we want to listen more. We want to be compassionate. We want to practice kindness and to always remember for all of us that our words have weight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Esmeralda Rivas and uh, I believe that we have a translator as well. Uh, so um, I think it's Diana, if you could ask uh, Ms. Rivas to introduce herself again and to let us know her association, that would be great. Sí. Esmeralda Rivas, ¿está usted aquí en la llamada? Hi, I'm here. I don't, I don't need a translator. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, we had it down here that it was in Spanish, so I apologize. It's okay. I, I speak Spanish too. I'm bilingual. Okay. I'm a dual immersion teacher. So uh, good evening, President Ish, trustees and superintendent Andrade. Uh, my name is Esmeralda Rivas. I'm a teacher at Los Padres Elementary. I teach third grade dual immersion. Um, I'm also a union member, a member of my school's PBIS tier one team. So PBIS in our district teaches our students to be upstanders against bullying. I believe we should lead by example. During the last board meeting, I felt disappointed and quite honestly appalled hearing what Trustee Ramirez said on social media regarding one of our academic coaches. Her words were unkind, unprofessional, disrespectful, and dismissive. We should lead by example for our students and choose words wisely, even when we disagree with someone. Name calling and put downs against staff by a board member is unacceptable. It hurts our district environment and creates a divide between parents and teachers. The focus should be on coming up with solutions and working together, not pointing fingers and closing doors. This upcoming December, I hope our board votes to keep President Ish in her position to create continuity and positivity to the board. Thank you. Thank you, and I apologize uh, for the mix-up. None needed. I, like I said, I'm a dual immersion teacher, so. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you're a great one because we thought it was in Spanish, so that's wonderful. Okay. Um, I believe that is the end of public comment. Thank you, and moving on, uh, we're going to listen to information items. Uh, 7.1, the expansion of the Salinas Public Library, smart cart card program and overdrive collection access to support our Salinas City Elementary School District students. Thank you. And oh. we have uh, the deputy librarian from the city of Salinas, Ms. Rialto, who's going to be uh, giving us that information piece. Thank you. Hi, um, good evening, um, Superintendent and board members of Salina City Elementary School District. My name is Mila Rianto, and I am the Deputy Librarian for Salinas Public Library. Uh, first off, I want to thank uh, uh, the Superintendent for the opportunity uh, to present this information. So um, I'm just gonna go right ahead to the information part of it. So I'm here to represent Salinas Public Library to provide information on the expansion of our smart card program and overdrive collection access to support um, Salina City Elementary School District students. So um, to start with, um, in case uh, in case you're uh, not aware, Smart Card program started in the 2018-2019 school year as a collaboration between the school district and the library. Uh, the library received a grant from the Student Success Initiative program 
to increase student access to library service in order um, to support their academic success by providing students um, access to library services using their student ID instead of having to apply for a library card. So uh, for some students, getting and maintaining a library card could be a barrier due to transportation issue, parental availability, um, you know, accumulating fees or fines on their uh, library card, or, you know, sometimes simply because they, they keep mis misplacing their library card. Um, so with the smart card, we launched the pilot program at four of SESD um, schools. Uh, we work with uh, Monica Macias um, from the IT department um, at the district and launch it at Los Padres, Sherwood, Roosevelt, and El Gabilan Elementary. Uh, it allows all students from those schools to use their student ID to access all of library's online collection uh, through the library's website and also the um, uh, IT department at the district able to include shortcuts uh, through the students um, clever portal. So it's easier to access. Um, additionally, because the library also wants to increase student engagement uh, to use the library, we, uh, we also allow students to borrow two books at a time uh, from the library just using their student ID uh, number. So um, fast forward to this year, uh, as we are preparing to upload, uh, you know, another batch of uh, student data for from those four schools, uh, we're approached by SESD uh, to see if we can expand the smart card program to include all um, schools uh, within the district. So um, the library, of course, understand that due to the pandemic and the instruct. Uh, instruction going to distance learning, uh, there's increased need um, for online resources to support student success. So we're, we're more than happy to accommodate the requests and working with the district, we managed to add um, more than 8,000 student data uh, to the smart card program, uh, I believe earlier this month. Um, so at the end of September, we did that. So um, at the beginning of this month, um, basically um, all students that we have uploaded uh, now have access to all uh, library res online resources um, just using their student ID number. Uh, they also uh, at the same time have access to borrow uh, books from the library um, two books at a time, um, again, just by using their um, uh, student ID number. So um, hope we're hoping that um, the continuing collaboration could meet its goal to at, um, help students um, become successful in their, in their studies. Um, another support that um, we recently able to uh, provide is uh, because the district recently acquired a new ebook e platform through Overdrive called Sora. Um, we are able to basically allow collaboration so that um, uh, access through Sora will also provide access uh, to the library's um, Overdrive collection. So currently our uh, ebook and audio e audiobook platform has more than um, 3,800 3, titles, almost 4,000 titles just for kids and teens. So uh, that actually, uh, because of this collaboration, uh, students can access it directly through the school's ebook platform. Um, and I actually uh, just checked the number last week and I found um, our numbers uh, more than 200 checkouts already happened since uh, the start of the program. So um, that's that's super positive in our in our in our point of view, and we hope that um, you know we can um, continue collaborate with the school district. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have a question or a comment? Okay, I do have a question. Um, so, I, let's say I'm a I'm a student at University Park School. 
okay. and I want to check out a book online. Uh, I can use my student ID to access uh, your library, you know, our library. And how easy is it to check out like uh, a book that I, you know, I mean, is there like a waiting? I'm, I'm trying, you know, I'm old school. So I'm, you know, like they used to have a waiting list to be able to get certain kinds of um, audio books. And I, are eBooks like really easy to access and can more than one student access an eBook at a time? Or uh, is there a limit or? I'm sorry, I just don't, I don't get it. So uh, I just kind of want to know. That's fine. Um, and you know, that's, that's why I'm here. So um, that depends on the book, um, honestly. Um, what we're also trying to provide is um, we're, we're still uh, working with the school, obviously. Uh, we're trying to get um, uh, some sort of reading list or, you know, uh, recommended books that, that teachers or the schools or the district recommending for students to read. Um, we're trying to get that list so that we can actually purchase those books or add it to the collection. So for our current collection, what we have is um, because on the like the ebook platform, there's different lending models uh, from the publisher. So some books we only have a limited copies, and some books we have unlimited copies. So um, honestly, that depends on which books we're talking about. Um, uh, but what what usually happens is, um, especially for kids, we usually purchase multiple copies especially if there's any uh, information from the schools or uh, some teachers let us know that, hey, um, you know, these are, uh, let's say I'm assigning this reading for, for our students. Usually we we'll purchase multiple copies. Um, I cannot guarantee that there will be, let's say 40 copies available um, uh, because, you know, that's budget consideration as well. But um, definitely we're, we're gonna try to uh, provide uh, as much access as possible for the students. Thank you very much. I'm, I really appreciate your time and the information that you gave us tonight. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. All right, and moving along, uh, 7.2, the special education study update. Yes, yeah, so it's been a while and uh, this study was, uh, uh, conducted about a year ago or two years ago. So we have our director of special ed here to provide us our update oh. recommendations and next steps that are being done. Good evening. Am I close enough to the microphone? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, President Ish, members of the board. Well, um, I'm saying yes, because I can hear you, but I don't know. <laughs> I do have a big voice. My brother's an opera singer. I can project <laughs> yeah. more. We can hear you. Okay. Is she okay? Yes. Okay. I'm assuming okay, you're perfect. okay. Um, I'll, I'm going to do that again. I, I interrupted my flow. So good, good evening, President Ish, members of the board, Dr. Andrade, and those of you out there viewing on the World Wide Web. I am Katie Ballesteri. I'm the Director of Special Education. And this evening, I'm happy to present to you where we are since our special education study occurred last June of 2019. If we could go to the next slide, please. So here's just a quick little timeline. In June of 2019, uh, the, sped, the special education study was completed. Um, in July of 2019, I started in the position of special education director along with um, Dr. Morales. And so we were a new ed services team in September. The ABLE Choice is the group that completed the study. They brought their findings to you all. And in October, we had a special study session where we had all of their recommendations broken down into their different components and we um, brought that to you. And then in January, we had an update to where we are, where we were at that time. Somewhere around March, we closed down schools and probably we would have had a spring update, um, but here we are today. 
So in December of 2019, we took that study to the new, at that point, special education leadership team, where we, um, as a group, took those 120 so odd recommendations and looked at what items were the most important to the district to start with. And so this evening, I'm going to present to you some of the items that have been completed, those items that are um, continuing and those items that will be started this year. But before I get there, I'd like to just let you know who is on that special education leadership team. Um, it is a group composed of not only our site administrators, but also special education staff, general education staff, um, and they are from a variety of sites. And we, we met last school year about three times and this school year we've met twice already and we'll be meeting again, um, I believe this week. So we, we are continuing to meet and work on the needs of our special education department. So, the, th the items that we would like to highlight, first off, I have to tell you, the special education department is quite a team. Um, this is not, none of this work has been easy and it has definitely taken a whole team to get it done. Um, our district-wide MTSS planning involved beyond the special education team and we were ready to roll out and then with school closure, it has taken a little bit longer, um, but that plan is ready to go. So that's very positive. Um, we also, like I said, we started our special education um, leadership team and we are right in the midst of getting ready, which is probably when I get to talk about what we're starting, getting ready to create our multi-year inclusion plan so that we can have more of our students in less restrictive environments. Um, and that's gonna be a big bulk of their work this year. And then the foundation of what we've been doing in our special education department is building our teams and building our relationships. And so um, that's been very successful. And there are a few steps we took beyond meeting with my staff regularly. Um, also just being able to listen has been important. One of the projects that Brendan and Judy, the program specialists last year undertook was creating what's known as the special circumstances individual assistance um, process. And through that process, when you have a student who has very high needs, usually for behavior, um, it's a way to collect all of the data and information needed to determine what are the best next steps for that student um, in some cases, it is important and it's necessary to have that one-to-one -one staffing for a student, but part of this process is also as you add that staff and that support, also having the, the goals in the FADE plan included so that the, the end result is that the student doesn't have that high level of intense staffing and need for the rest of their scholastic career, but that we can slowly fade a way so that they can be independent students. And um, also, also um, our professional development for our classified staff was a focus, focus last year um, for what we did call our behavior intervention specialists, now known as paraeducator threes. Um, we increased the amount of professional development available to them on an ongoing regular basis, and that is still continuing this school year. What we will continue, um, we will continue to have those meetings, like I said, with our special education leadership team, um, our professional development. We will continue to participate in the Supporting Inclusive Practices Grant as we work with that special education leadership team to really have that long-term planning for our students. Um, and we will continue not only to provide that professional development for our classified staff, but to expand and to um, 
the word's not solidify, but I will use that word today to solidify <laughs> what happens at each level for all of our staff so that there aren't gaps in their training and that we know that a para one has this training, a para two has this training, a para three has this level of training. And for this year, for this school year, we're really focusing in my office at, um, at reconciling the data in our IEP system and in our SIS system. We're hopeful that as we roll into a new SIS system, this will be easier. But as of now, we're having frequent meetings with the SELPA information um, secretary so that we can make sure that our records match um, in the IEP system and in our SIS system. We're also really hoping to create a handbook uh, for all of our staff and our parents that includes the descriptions of each of our programs. And that will help our staff to understand if a student's in this program, and I think that program would be better, what that means for our students and also for our parents um, and for, uh, for us in general. And that is a summarized version of where we are in special education. Can I answer any questions for you? Okay, well, I always do. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I remember from this report, uh, one of our goals was to decrease the reliance on um, uh, private uh, <coughs> non-public agencies uh, who were uh, providing us with, with much needed services because we didn't have the capacity built uh, and I know that there was a plan in place to build capacity, and I'm hearing you say we have the paraprofessional threes. Uh, my question is, are we seeing a decrease in our reliance on the non-public agency and an increase in our, uh, our own um, ability to provide the very same services to our students? And um, so I guess that's the first part of my question. So are, are we doing that? Are we getting there? You approved a contract for four. We are down to four NPA served students in our district. So we have definitely decreased that reliance on the outside vendors to provide that service for our students. And part of that goes back to that SCIA process that I spoke of, that it helps us to really determine what that best level of service will be for our students. And because we do have that highly, highly trained staff on hand that through the years our BCBAs have trained and then we've added and we've trained more, um, we, can take, we can take care of that need for our students. We also are finding that with the PBIS implementation across our sites um, and with our psychologists being very involved in the PBIS implementation, um, that we're able to sort of provide students what they need in their classrooms without having to rely on that one-to-one -one staff. Okay. And, um, okay. And so um, my next part of that question is, as we are developing this cadre of, of very highly trained staff, um, when someday, God willing, we come back to school and our children, um, are back in the classroom, whether it be in, you know, a hybrid small groups or whether it be, you know, fortunate enough to bring them all back. Um, I'm going to predict that we are going to see an uptick in, um, in behaviors because we haven't been together for a while. So I know that uh, the behavior intervention specialists are, um, are particularly focused on our special ed students, but I also know we have used them with our general ed students um, as well. So is that going to continue to be a plan or are you, is, I mean, are we gonna increase this group of, of, of people so that we are in anticipation of, of uh, what's to come? So we're not all of us like, being reactive that we are, you know, we have this highly trained group of people ready to go in and support teachers when they 
uh, are going to need it. So you're talking about what what we used to call the behavior intervention specialist that we now call para yes, threes, I, right? Yes. The classified I, staff. Yeah, I wanted to kind of designate them out because I I do know that they were used when I think of of uh, paraprofessional theories. I'm, I guess I'm thinking mainly of special education. They are uh, all special education currently. Yes. Okay. But I know some of them were used in classrooms with some students who were not considered um, children with special needs, or am I wrong on that? In the past, there may have been some students who had 504 plans who had that level of service. Uh -huh. In general, a student who requires that level of service would most likely, of course, there are always outliers, but would most likely qualify for special education services. Okay. Um, that's not to say that our staff wouldn't be ready to jump in. Um, our staffing this school year originally was supposed to have what we're calling floaters. If at school sites with higher, um, higher amounts of students who tend to have the behaviors mm -hmm. that need the extra hands, um, we've had a little bit of attrition in the para three uh, cadre of staff for a variety of reasons. A lot of our para threes, well, we hired two to be teachers in classrooms. A lot mm -hmm. of our para threes go back to school um, to be teachers or school psychologists or BCBAs, which is awesome. And we absolutely support them in that, but it does leave us having to refill those positions. Um, as we open our small cohorts, we will definitely have that indicator of what that level of service is going to need to be. Mm -hmm. And we may have to really think about how many floaters a site may need for that purpose, okay. as well as the funding for that. Because if they're not attached to students with IEPs, right? how does that work right. specifically? Right. Yeah. yeah. OK. Thank you. Thank and you. I just wanted to add to that. Good evening, board members. I'm back here just supporting Kitty. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to add was we do have a position of counselors that we've never had in the past. So as we're thinking of bringing students back, we want to make sure that we have a good SEL plan for that transition. And um, our new counselors would be a big part of putting that plan together. Great. Okay, great. So we're excited to have them because we didn't have them in the past. Yeah. So. All right. I, that's nice to know. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Katie. Does anybody else have any other questions than just me? Okay. Thank you. Katie, thank you very much. All right, moving on, our governor's handbook. Um, mm -hmm. And I am thanking you for bringing this back. We, uh, this has been a long time in the making. Uh, you know, Francisco and I, I think we sat back, it had to have been five years ago because it's when we first came on the board that we originally started looking at uh, some sort of handbook. Um, and uh, it looks like this one, we, um, we looked at, uh, we developed, you know, it looks like we approved it in, on July 11th of 2018, but then we realized that we needed to make some revisions and it was at a board retreat, I believe, um, August 7th of 2019, wasn't it? This year? No, it was, when? no, but it was before that oh. when we were over at, uh, I think we were meeting with um, the aquarium at the aquarium when we were meeting mm -hmm. with uh, Nicole. yeah Nicole that we again <laughs> looked at uh, <laughs> revising it, and then this year we finally nailed it. So uh, it's it's like what is it three strikes and you're out, but this is three <laughs> attempts and we're in. So um, thank you for bringing this to us. You're welcome, and don't let's not talk about baseball <laughs> yeah. oh, oh the Dodgers not doing well yeah, no. oh they, oh, they, I'm they, they oh i'm sorry oh i so this 
Yeah. This is information. This so is information. we are bringing it so. for your discussion and as an information item for you to consider. Uh, this was uh, a draft form in the, and it is a, still a draft form um, that we began the discussion in August 7 of this year. And um, there's a couple of um, grammar that I've uh, included for your recommendation and um, for you to to look at, but no, this is for us to have this discussion and for you as elected officials to decide. Okay, and I I just would like to point out um, that when we first started this uh, quite a few years ago, we had a, a there, there was a, a group of stakeholders that came together and uh, this was based on uh, a lot of their input and um, we had a, a, a mission statement and a vision statement that this group had put together but looking I, I just wanted to point out that looking at the vision statement now remember this vision statement it's not even two years old I think it goes back almost five you know four or five years and it's we expect all children to be at or above grade level and I'm just curious um, before we commit to that, if that is something that we might want to have our stakeholders look at again, because our world has changed a lot. There may be many other things that um, we see as, as a better vision so for our district. So um, that would be the sure. one thing that I would point out. I'm happy to, uh, to do the research and find the work that has already been done in, uh, in the past so that I can bring it forward to the next to the next time that we bring this up. Okay, thank you. And does anybody have any questions or comments? I do, on page eight, it talks about no votes or abstentions and it says, remember if the governing board casts a no vote or abstains from voting on a particular issue as a courtesy, the member offers a short statement as to the reason for his or her action. I don't think that we can make a board member have to say why they voted no on something unless they want to mm. um, and because if it's like a lone vote, like if it's a 4-1 and a board member votes no and they don't want to say anything, it still passes. So that even that board member who voted no has to support what the majority of the board mm -hmm. voted for. So I don't think that a board member should feel like they have to say why they voted a certain way. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if that's almost a run on because I, I believe it was, I knew if you abstain, you need to state um, the reason that you are Actually, abstaining. Actually, you don't, you don't you have don't? to, no. A board member doesn't have to, they can just say abstain because an abstention also becomes a yes vote. It becomes a part of the majority. If it's a yes, if it's a yes, oh. the abstention becomes a part of the majority vote. But I just kind of feel like no board member should feel like they have to explain themselves if they don't want to. This is, we're making this decision for years to come, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I and as you know, so you're asking that we just go ahead and strike that. I think board. that lap. I mean, because then there would be no reason. Because even. board members, even if you're like a lone vote for or against something, whatever the majority of the board votes for, you have to support it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten clarification on that from mm -hmm. Monterey County, from the clerk of the board for the board of supervisors because there was some issue a board member didn't want to sign a resolution at one time. And it was like, you have to sign the resolution because the majority of the board voted for it. And then the board member signed the resolution. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't just don't think that a board member should feel like they have to. I mean, yeah, board members have want to, they can, but this kind of says you have to. Yeah. No, I, See, I, I always thought if you abstained, you had to state the reason you were abstaining, like a conflict Can of interest. Can we look into or... that? Because I didn't hear yeah. that. It, I mean, you I... know, the, my, uh, my experience is that when there's an abstention, it, it's almost like the uh, whoever is abstaining normally volunteers the reason for their abstention. Yeah. But on a no, yeah, I didn't you know, no, no one has, has to provide a, yeah. Yeah. A, an explanation. Yeah. No, but I would agree. Francisco, with that. isn't it an abstention when there's a conflict of interest? That's what I usually, thought. yeah. Yeah. Usually. Right. Right. Yeah. And I always thought you had to state the, you know, I'm abstaining because I have a conflict of interest. If you have a conflict the... of interest, I think, because yeah. I could just say I abstain and not say why. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, I didn't think you were allowed to abstain unless you just had a... That's something we probably need to look well, into. Well, you know, the, uh, the, um, the philosophy is that, you know, why are you a board member if you're abstaining? You're mm-hmm. supposed to be voting. Mm-hmm. And, um, but there, there are situations where a board member feels that if they vote either way, it's, it's going against, it, it messes up, for lack of a better word, the perception mm-hmm. of the board. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He brings like a, a bad image on the mm-hmm. board if he votes one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And I, I saw that done at the Monterey County Board a number of times mm-hmm. for those reasons. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, they, they always felt that they they needed to provide an explanation, but never on a no vote. They provided if they wanted to, but, mm-hmm. you know, we I don't remember ever, ever it having been required. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Andrade, could you look into that for us just on abstention? Because if you don't have to give a reason for abstention, then I say we strike that whole section. I I, I will definitely look at it. And I just wanted to point out that it it does say as a courtesy. So it's not a requirement. But um, we we will look further into this piece. And then also look into... um, whether you have to state the conflict of interest. Cause I, I'm confused on that because okay. I, I haven't always heard people uh, um, state the conflict of interest when they, when they've had one. Yeah, I, don't I don't think they, you have to specifically say it, but. I no, I don't know. I just, do. I just know that there were times when someone had a conflict of interest because they owned property mm-hmm. and it was going to, this, whatever the vote was going to impact the property. But I, I, we all knew that, but I don't think that person declared, had to, felt, had to declare unless they wanted to. Mm-hmm. So just, just to mm-hmm. know, because it might not impact us today, but it might impact another, we have a board member who owns mm-hmm. a ton of property in Salinas in the future. And just so that as we're creating this for sure. years mm-hmm. forward. Mm-hmm. Okay. Does anybody else see anything that they would like to comment? Or, um, I believe what we probably should do before the next board meeting, when it's going to come back and we'll adopt it, is if you see something, uh, if you could let Dr. Andrade know. And um, other than that, thank you very much for bringing this back. I just want to, one more thing is yes. on page eight is the agenda development. Mm-hmm. And it says that any person can place an item on the agenda. But that's not just any item we need to clarify that it has to be the district, the, the business of the district. Mm-hmm. Because that's really vague. I think we need to, to look at some of this stuff and where it's vague, we need to be very clear because ed code is very clear. Okay. Now, what do they mean by any person? Any person of the public? Yeah, that means if well, someone from the public would like to see something on the agenda, but it's always been my understanding. That it's, through a, us, though. it's through you. It's through us that through us. we make the decision as to. For whether. example, if somebody's my constituent, they have to. They need to ask me or ask another board member, and then we we bring it forth. You know, it's not like they can bring it forth directly no. to the president and the superintendent. Oh, see, I didn't know that. I mean, I I was kind of thinking that they could, but it wasn't necessarily a guarantee that it was going to be on the agenda. That that there would be a discussion as to the relevance of. Yeah, right. This but, to district right. Business. But it first has to pass through a board member. Okay. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm pretty yes, sure. Yeah, I, I it it has that. to go through a board. They can't come directly to the superintendent and say, I want this on the agenda. My but understanding is okay. they need to come to a board member. Okay. But that doesn't, but it also doesn't mean like if someone says, I want you to put buying four motorcycles on your agenda. Well, there's no biz- there's no district need for four motorcycles. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Just yeah. make an example. Yeah. 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 And so it, it it has to be a district need. And then we have to allow for the superintendent and the president. And I'm not this is not about you. This is just my like what you were saying. It's my on top of that is is that it doesn't come on to the next agenda. It comes on timely like the immunization thing remember when that came up right and we had already had it planned for like april right and so so that's when you need to come back and say so we will be having this item on the agenda but it will be in three months because that's when we have it in the master calendar yeah 
But Francisco could be right. I mean, yeah, it, I don't know. One it's, more point of clarification, my, my Dr. Andrade, if you could find Absolutely. out, that yes. would be great. These are all good. Thank you. Um, any more? Okay. Uh, moving on, we are now um, at action items. And 8.1 is our Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. It's always nice to hear this because that means we still have bond money that we can spend on much needed uh, site repairs. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, President Ish, Superintendent Andrade and board members. Uh, we would like to present tonight two names to fill vacancies in our Citizens Oversight Committee for Bond. <coughs> The first name is Laura Ramirez, who has applied as a parent applicant. The second uh, name is Samantha Aris, who has ap applied as a, a parent general member applicant. We'd like to present these two names for board approval. Um, are these names taking the place of two people who have left, or are we adding two more on? No, this is filling vacancies. Okay. And it, it should, that's not written down here in front of me, so I don't have it right in front of me on who did leave. This completes the, uh, the ability for us to move forward with the- It gives us a quorum. We still have one vacancy that we're oh, okay. advertising for. Okay. Correct. Who are the two people that you said? You're, he didn't. Yeah, Laura or? Ramirez and Samantha Aris. Oh, so they were two parents. The two parents who left are being replaced by two more parents. Correct. Or three There's, parents. Yes. One of whom. Um, but the one parent really would be considered a general member. A general member. Correct. Yes. Oh, yes. I see that. Yeah. Okay. It's so hard to find parents to be on a bond oversight committee and we're lucky to have three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> yes. We're, we're still trying to recruit um, our senior citizen member of the, the board. That is the vacancy we still have left, but we're out advertising. For oh, it. I know a few senior citizens. Uh, yeah, we'd love probably. we'd love for them to come in and, <laughs> and join the committee. Okay. And so, so you need them for quorum, and uh, um, without with, quorum, you're pretty much at a standstill. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yes. Are they meeting through Zoom? W yes, we are. We and are. How meeting many through meetings Zoom. do you plan? I mean, if we're going to look help, I mean, if one of us, Amy's going to find someone. How many so, meetings a year do they have to typically um, attend? We looked at four as a maximum. Okay. We typically want to meet a couple of times to approve projects and then another um, end of the year meeting or end of the fiscal year meeting to review all the projects and expenditures. Is that the only position that you're looking to fill? Mm -hmm. um, with the acceptance of these two applicants, then our vacant position then would be a senior citizen okay. position, correct? I know a few. <laughs> okay. I move to approve. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? I second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We welcome these two wonderful parents to our citizens. <laughs> Thank you. Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. Thank they, you. Uh, they do an important work. Yes. They, they are doing important yes. work. Thank you very much. Oh. And I'm guessing you're still here mm -hmm. for 8.2 uh, Belly Architects contract for Sherwood School. Oh, the one we were all like questioning. Our, yes. Our last board meeting, we presented this as an information item. Um, we, we took all the comments back. And we did some looking and we feel like we're ready to move forward to present the approval for a contract. Um, understand that at this point, no design work has been done because the contract has not been approved to do design work. But we are looking at a couple of options to bring back to the board to look at before we move forward with the full project. And the architect will be working with uh, the uh, site administration or the site People, we uh, we like, always include our principal when we're doing these plans. So yes, primarily I'll be the contact, but we always include our principal. Um, 
on, on any of the projects that we do. Great. All right. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Is Marcus back at Sherwood? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any? All right. I'm going to call for a motion. I move that we approve. Okay. And a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Can you clarify who second for the record? Uh, you had two people at the oh, same I time. did. I'll go with Art. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Moving on, um, we have our consent agenda. Was there anything on the consent agenda that anybody wanted to pull for questions or discussion? All right, then do I have a motion? Move to approve. All right, and a second? second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor of adopting the consent or approving the consent agenda? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. So, I can't believe it's eight o'clock, only eight. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on, we have our superintendent update, Dr. Andrade. Thank you. Um, I wanted to provide information on um, just waivers, but it really is tied to um, an announcement of a town hall meeting. It's been a while since we had one, and I think it's time for our community to come back together and just get an update on how distance learning is going, but also here on the process. Um, the purple tier is the most restrictive of the four tiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means that COVID-19 is widespread and Monterey County continues to be in this category, meaning that the schools cannot reopen unless they receive a waiver. Um, and on Thursday this uh, week, we are gonna be bringing our community together to share that information. Prior to applying for the waiver, the district must one, consult with labor parent and community organizations. And uh, the second thing would be to publish the reopening plans on the district website. When it comes to the safety guidelines, I believe that our district has done a great job in addressing them, not just in the current plans, but in the programs that we already have in place, such as the cleaning, the disinfection, uh, the small stable cohorts, uh, ensuring that we have an entrance and um, an egress and movement within the school and our physical distancing, the healthy hygiene practices and communication plans. The testing of students and staff, as well as the surveillance testing are uh, still topics of discussion and one where we as a county, we are still sharing information and increasing collaboration. As of today, there are no public school districts in the city of Salinas that have applied for a waiver. The waiver application must confirm that both parents as well as our labor partners were consulted. And it is really important that our parents and families understand this. Prior to presenting a plan to the Board of Trustees, the district will need to provide that information and ensure that our parents and families have that, as well as opportunities to have their questions answered and uh, understand that it is a shared process. So I think what you uh, may also know that is coming after that is another survey <laughs> for our families um, because that's how we are trying to gather more uh, data points as well. So just know it's coming. Um, I invite you to come to our uh, town hall meeting. It's October 29 of this week at 5 p.m. in English and at 6.30 p.m. in Spanish. And uh, that is all that I have at this moment. But if I may add one more thing, um, it's related to special education. And I just wanted to mention that there's really a, a huge expectation for um, an unprecedented level of uh, special education litigation this year. And we uh, as a district have already received news um, and being included a national and a state class action lawsuit um, I think that the thing that our educators and therapists, and I want to give them credit, is that they're being incredibly creative in finding ways and innovatively trying to meet the needs of our students. But there are over 700 mandates in an IDEA um, 
for students with disabilities and the inability to meet just one of them, including during the pandemic, puts us at risk for litigation. So I wanted to put that in your forefront. <laughs> Thank you and on that sharing. note. <laughs> Thank you for sharing <laughs> yes. uh, that information. Um, is there anything nice you want to say? <laughs> on the town hall meeting on the 29th, mm -hmm. what are the times again? 5 p.m. in English and 6.30 in Spanish. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So um, do you envision this to be a discussion mm -hmm. or is it going to be led by staff and, or you we, allow parents? Because I've gotten a lot of emails about this. Yes. And, and I'm, uh, I want this to be a discussion. I want to be able to really have an opportunity to hear from all of our community and uh, answer their questions, but also provide the information that I just gave you um, as well and talk about the steps of how we would be able to move forward. So are you, when you do a survey, I mean, I envision, I mean, one of the questions I wanna know is by school, by Absolutely. area, yes, by, by grade, um, by neighborhood, by grade. Mm -hmm. And also I, I wanna know um, the qualitative aspect of it. So why, I mean, I, I mean, if parents feel like they want to share with us why they are choosing to have their kids, maybe a to have them go back into the classroom? Like, what is the factor, you mm -hmm. know? Because it could be that they don't have anybody to watch them at home. I don't know, but mm -hmm. it, it might be something that might be bigger than us that could be addressed at a higher level, like at the, the city mm -hmm. or the county, because it might be something that they could remedy so that we make sure that we're not rushing into anything or forcing people to make decisions because they feel pushed in a corner because of that. Okay. Or because a lot, I mean, I've just had a lot of, I've spoken to a lot of parents and, and they're, they're really concerned and um, about their, their situations. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm Thank you. Anyone else have any? questions or comments on this. Well, thank you. We'll look forward to um, hearing about how this all goes mm -hmm. as we gather information uh, and understanding, because I want to clarify, we are not talking about applying for a waiver at this no, moment. No, we are not. Because I, I don't, you know, the last thing I need is misinformation to get out there yeah. that, oh, the board was talking about waivers, because uh, <laughs> that's probably going to be a takeaway from this. So this is not uh, leading, you know, th this is not leading us up to, to us applying for a waiver. This is just gathering information. So we have that information on that, and that is a perfect way of <laughs> explaining this. And it's because we're getting some, these misunderstandings that we want to be able to give that clarity to okay, everyone. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Um, all right. And now uh, moving on, we are going to hear from the board. And um, in honor of uh, <laughs> National <laughs> Filipinos uh, week, we'd love to hear from our uh, favorite board member <laughs> of that ethnicity. Uh, and the only. Well, very proud yes. to, uh, to represent uh, Mr. Galimba. Well, I would just like to say I was born and raised in Saline, actually Fort Ord, and and raised in Salinas all my life, except for about a few years up in Seattle. And I've enjoyed living in Salinas. We've had our issues in this city, but you know what? All cities have that, and so uh, I am a proud. I am proud to be a citizen of Salinas. And uh, you know, I remember the days when I used to be working out in the fields uh, with the Hispanics and working side by side, uh, going out in those Becero buses and going out there to Greenfield and Thin and do other things. And, you know, that was part of my culture. And I think that was part of the Filipino culture. So um, I'm, I am proud and uh, to raise my children and my grandchildren, Salinas. So 
And I think um, my mom, she was one of the one of the queens of the Filipino uh, community back in the I think 60s when they used to have that in the Filipino American community. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a lot of heritage here in Salinas and being born and raised and still living here in Salinas. It's a great community. Um, I just want to also say that sometimes in my area where I'm, I <clears throat> go to Cammon and uh, El Gavilan unexpectedly at, with visits and visiting with the site administrators. You know, I just go there just to find out, see how everything's going. Because, you know, with COVID and <clears throat> different things that our teachers are going through, I want them to know that the board is behind them and um, willing to help them in whatever capacity. So it's not that I'm going there to be Snoopy or anything, but I believe that each of those principals understand that I am supporting them as well as the teachers too, and our communities. So that's, Thank that's you, it Mr. Columbo. from the Filipino. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Ramirez. Um, I have nothing right now. Okay. I, I have a little Salana. something, and it's maybe a continuation of uh, with Mr. Galimba and uh, Filipino Heritage Month. I believe next month is Mexican Heritage Month. <laughs> I should know that. Um, some common history, Mr. Galimba. Uh, World War II, uh, Mexico entered uh, the war on the side of the United States. Um, there were 16,000 volunteers, Mexican volunteers. Uh, looking for an expedited um, expedited U.S. citizenship. So they enlisted in the U.S. Armed Forces. Mexico sent 50 of its most um, outstanding aviators, and they formed a squadron in Texas, and they were shipped out of Alameda to the Philippines. They were known as the Aztec Eagles, and they fought in the Philippines alongside Filipino pilots and American pilots to liberate the Philippines. And they were decorated, highly decorated uh, in, in uh, the Philippines by the, the president or prime minister who was in charge at that time. So not only in the agricultural aspect here in California, but we have Filipinos and Mexican Americans, or Mexicans have a lot of common history and we owe you a debt of gratitude Thank you. Thank you very much for those thoughts. <laughs> Mrs. Pierce. Oh. Well, uh, I guess I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna keep it really short. Um, we've talked about creating uh, and providing support through our behavior and actions by acting with professional demeanors the models the districts believes and envisions, right? All that is what we've drafted on. And I've only been here and had the pleasure since April. And I had the honor and opportunity to be part of the hiring process with uh, Dr. Andrade. And I'm happy to be part of that. Um, and obviously there's a little lack of confidence in the district's governance with the current events and the COVID situation this negative tendency occurring at this very moment is unhealthy for us, unhealthy for our staff, unhealthy for our bodies, unhealthy for our students. Um, this really creates a deeply divided district, right? We need to stand together. And as we would say, si se puede, why? Why can we do this? Because we care about our students, right? And we've heard it from some staff that people do and parents Teachers, admin, we obviously care about the students. And we do need to keep that focused for the best interest of the students. And I know that we can do this and we need to stop being divided and things will work out if we stand together. You know, be the leaders that we are and show the integrity, communicate, be positive, be that positive influence that we need. Not just for our students, but for ourselves, for our staff, for our superintendent, and um, just, I appreciate all the staff that goes above and beyond. 
because those are the great leaders that we need. And I know there's a lot out there, you know, and those people will be followed by other great leaders, other great staff. And it's just, you know, a wonderful vision that we can, you know, create so that our students can one day come back and be those great leaders, you know, for our community. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. That was nice very work. well said. Thank you. Um, and then I'm going to finish off by um, uh, congratulating Monterey Park School on becoming the second Blue Zones uh, designated school in the city. Uh, I think Salinas City is really uh, waving the proud banner of health and uh, well-being, and I'm really proud of our two schools that have um, stepped up, and I, I think other schools are in line to join in. Uh, so I did want to give a shout out to Monterey Park School. Uh, I also uh, wanted to uh, respond. I, I, I honestly believe, um, despite any kind of, of uh, perceptions of, uh, of people, that uh, this is a board that really does care. We, we care about our children. Um, we care about our staff. We, we really do. We care about our administrators who are leading uh, during this very difficult time. Um, we care about our superintendent and we are so grateful to have her here with us, um, really champion championing um, the idea of social emotional well-being. Uh, I think I saw recently, you know, I, I don't do Facebook, uh, not because I don't want to, but because I'm going to be really honest, I don't know how to. And I was very fortunate that I had my, my niece, who is so savvy in tech, uh, help me with a lot of things. But um, then she, you know, she has a job, so she's not here to help me all the time. <laughs> and my only, you know, my other children just kind of look at me. Uh, so I, I kind of stay away from that. But, you know, every once in a while I hear about things. And um, I, I think I heard recently that um, people are getting tired of saying, you know, you're going to be all right. You know, let's just breathe. Let's just take, you know, they're getting tired of that. At, that they want something a little different. And I don't know, what I, what I can say um, came from a conversation that um, Ms. Ramirez and I had earlier, and that is, let us know, please tell us what you need. This board is here to support, we really are. We're um, equally blind in all of this, and uh, we just need to know what you need. And if we know what you need, if it's at all possible, we'll make sure the resources are there to get them to you. Uh, I think I heard tonight from I don't know who it was about you know the feeling of don't give us you know don't give us new stuff right now. Okay, we hear you. If you don't need new stuff, you have to be, you know, let us know what that new stuff is so we can like maybe, yeah, like we can encourage people to just lighten your load. Um, so I, I, I really do want to make sure everybody knows that this is a, a board that supports, their, and I know our administrators uh, do as well, supports our teachers and our families and um I think uh, what we heard from uh, Mrs. Burleson tonight about we all need to be working together and listening to one another is very important. So um, I'm hoping we can in the next few weeks before Thanksgiving, because it's that time of year almost, uh, really focus on, on you know, what we can do to help one another out. So with that, I'm going to stop and um, I though you know what I just got a message and, and from a parent and they were saying their email right now that they had submitted public comment and they didn't understand that it was going to be on video and that her public comment was received before seven o'clock 
Um, and um, she's upset that it wasn't, um, that she wasn't able to understand the new process. And so um, I'm wondering if I, if, um, if I could read it because she did hand it in in enough time. And this is a parent. This is um, Medea Baez. Is, does anybody have an objection? And she's, she's just upset that she just wanted to talk about, um, um, she wanted to advocate for one of our schools. And so, um, because she did hand it in and I can use it as my board time. Is this, can okay. I clarify? Yes, yes, can you clarify? Uh, but yeah, I totally agree, it's just that, um, we end, we end public comment now, it's I think, at 6.30 now. So it's oh. between 5 and 6.30. That one came in at 6.27. Uh, maybe Actually, it now. came in at 4.58 p.m. Um, yeah, we didn't get that. I mean, I don't have that. I, I, it's up to it's up to so Mayor. i'm just yeah. i'm just saying because yeah. it allowed because, okay. i guess well uh, governance part is it allowed right now at this moment in um time? i can i'm allowed to say whatever i want i could read anything that yeah I but want. you're you're reading for the comment I'm just, no but i'm reading know. what a parent has sent in and that's so, if you, so you have a but so if if that's the issue you also don't have other parents so what yeah. she's so what I'm saying what why don't we do this why don't we just ask Tina to print a copy of that email that was sent in um, and and make sure that the board gets a copy of it okay. and um, and if and, we can and then we can make it we can and then you can follow could... up with the parent to make sure that they understand how to use the new system yeah, right um, if and we then, could just do that um, we would certainly invite um, yeah. Mrs. Bias to our next board meeting to um, give public comment as well. But I, I yeah. So why don't we just do that? Because okay. Since mm -hmm. since we were done, and so just if if Tina could just give a copy to sure. each board member sure. so that they know. Sure. And uh, again, I, I apologize to the public because we're we're trying new things to make sure we hear you. Uh, it. It's actually so much better we, when we can see you as well because it feels um, just a little more personal. So uh, I, I'm, I, I know this transition into this type is gonna be kind of glitchy. So yes, I would love for that to be printed off so we could all receive a copy. And then also to invite uh, Mrs. To Baez to the next, the next meeting. meeting to mm -hmm. please read the public comment because we would, we would wanna hear from her. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, the schedule of meetings and coming events. Of course, this Thursday is our town hall meetings. So thank you for that reminder. And our next scheduled uh, board meeting is on November the 9th. It will be after election day. And so we will have, um, this will be our last board meeting with um, Mrs. Pierce. And it's going to be very, uh, very sad because we have just enjoyed having you with us uh, too. yes plenty of tissues and uh it, it really is it really is and i'm not even going to get started because we'll all say our goodbyes at the next meeting but um we wish you well and we hope that you will return to us at some point in the future um okay uh if, is there anything anybody would like to see placed on the next agenda? If not, then if you think of something, either email myself or Dr. Andrade. And with that, we are going to gavel out and adjourn at 8.36. Thank you very much, everybody.